Good morning, church families. Uh, today's Bible reading is coming from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 9 to 18. Book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 9 to 18. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand, thousand served him, and ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The court said in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven. There came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom to all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Don't worry, that was not my foot. Did everyone hear that loud bang over there? Okay. Daniel chapter 7 is where we'll be looking this morning as we continue in our series, Against the Tide, Choosing to Take a Stand. We've now come to the second part of Daniel chapter 7, which we could refer to, initially at least, as the saint's everlasting rest. Now, for some of you, I hope that's a familiar title, there's a famous text written in the 17th century by a well-known theologian and pastor, Richard Baxter, in England, called The Saints' Everlasting Rest. Uh, Baxter himself was in the middle of a long illness and facing the prospect and possibility of death from that illness. He wrote this book about the promises of God for Christians, for the saints of God, about how God had promised them rest. But there are other promises in the scripture, not just about rest, but about, as we're about to find in this passage, about dominion or what we might call inheritance and what God has in store for those who follow him in the future, in his everlasting kingdom. And that's what we want to consider over the next few moments from this passage. And in order to do so, we're first going to look at Daniel's vision. You remember this is the first of four visions that Daniel had that God gave him. With a lot of strange images in this first one, it's images of four different beasts. And we want to consider what the fourth beast was. And then we, will gonna, we are going to consider what the passage says about the Ancient of Days. That's a title for God, God the Father particularly. And then about God the Son, entitled the Son of Man and the dominion that he's given. And so we'll just kind of follow the progression of thought in this passage and come to a conclusion by the end of it. And throughout, what we'll see is this. The Son of Man, who is Jesus, has the rightful dominion over the world. That is, he's in charge. But in love and grace, when he fully sets up his kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, he is going to graciously share his dominion with his people. So let's understand the first, or the fourth beast, I should say. In verses 7 and 8, we see the initial vision given. He says, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, 
terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And you remember we were told in verse 17, which we looked at last week, these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. There are kings or kingdoms that are represented by these beasts. So how do we try to figure out what this fourth beast represents? Well, you remember last week, we saw that the first beast was a lion with wings, and that represented the Babylonian Empire. And then the next beast in line was the lopsided bear that had three ribs, kind of oddly, in its mouth. And that pictured the Medo-Persian Empire, which came directly after the Babylonian Empire and overtook it. Following on from that, the third beast was a leopard with four wings and four heads. Kind of a strange-looking beast, no doubt. And this represented the empire of Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire, which rapidly overtook all the previous Persian empires, both Babylonian and Medo-Persian, all that area, and much more, before it was eventually split into four parts, represented by those four wings and four heads, into four parts by the four generals of Alexander the Great. And I remind us that these predictions, these um, visions and prophecies, if you will, were given about 500 years before Jesus showed up on the scene. And what that means is the vast majority of these prophecies were given decades or hundreds of years prior to the events that they describe. And they describe all of it in detail, and every detail was clear and came true. Now, through these three beasts the king and the kingdoms they represent, you remember the lesson we learned was that God rules in history, through human history, even though he's outside of it. Remember, God is outside of space and time. He is not bound to it. He is the creator of space, time, and matter. But he is the one who rules in history, through history, and over history. And now we get to the fourth beast, and we see that same theme continue. The fourth beast is Rome, and it's described in verses 19 to 24. By the way, if you have a pew Bible in front of you, uh, there are black pew Bibles. You can look up in Daniel chapter 7 and follow along with us if you'd like, or you can just listen as I read. Daniel 7, 19 to verse 24 says this, then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, Daniel says. So after all of this, the beast that really gave him pause and concern was this fourth beast. He said it was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, and with its teeth of iron, its claws of bronze, which devour and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And he was also concerned about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up before the three of them fell and the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things. And it seemed greater than all of its companions. And as I looked, this horn made war. With the saints, saints in the Old Testament, New Testament, is just another name for followers of God. So it made war with the followers of God and prevailed over them until the ancient of days came and the judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So the followers of God are initially uh, sought after by this leader. They are terrorized, we might say, but then eventually they gain the victory. Thus he said in verse 23... As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. And as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. There's a lot going on here. But the identity of this fourth beast following on in world empire succession from Babylon, Medo-Persia, then Greece, is obviously the Roman Empire. The ten horns here correspond to the ten iron toes you might remember in Nebuchadnezzar's statue vision that he had in Daniel chapter 2. These ten horns are either ten rulers or ten sections of the Roman kingdom. Uh, The reason that this is a, a little bit of a quandary 
is w as to whether they refer to ten specific kings or Caesars or ten sections of the kingdom is as follows. You might remember kingdoms are represented in the Bible and in all ancient literature by the kings, the main king or kings, who led that country. So Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king of the Babylonian Empire, he kind of stands for the whole kingdom of Babylon, even though Babylon lasted much longer than just his lifespan. So too Alexander the Great stands for, or stands in place of, the Greek Empire, even though the Greek Empire really outlasted Alexander by a significant margin. But the challenge with the Roman Empire is it's not quite the same. The Roman Empire, unlike these other three empires, although it had a Caesar, an emperor, it, it was also run by a senate. That is, the, the Caesar or the emperor did not have absolute power like in the other kingdoms. And so should we understand these ten horns to be ten specific leaders? Or what we know from history is that eventually the Roman Empire was split into ten sections. And each of those sections had a puppet king that answered to Caesar and the Senate in Rome. For instance, in Matthew chapter 2, you might remember when Jesus is born in Bethlehem of Judea and the wise men come to worship him, and Herod, the king of Palestine, finds out about it. Of course, he tries to have Jesus killed. Herod was the puppet king of the region, one of the ten regions of the Roman Empire, known as Palestine. So should we understand this to be ten kings or the ten segments of the empire? That's a little bit unclear. But we'll keep going and see if we can get some clarity. Scholars, Christian scholars, also admit a little bit of a question mark when it comes to this fourth kingdom. Because what's said about this small horn that springs up it's a little confusing. No doubt, as, as we read it out loud, maybe you were a little confused. Okay, is the horn part of this kingdom? Is it different? Is it taking over a portion of this kingdom and then spreading out? Well, it is a little confusing because he says very clearly in verses 23 and 24, another king or leader or group shall arise after them, after these ten horns, and he shall be different from the former ones. So he's connected to them, but also different, and he comes after them. Does that mean he comes directly after? Or does that mean there's a space of time before this one shows up, but that he's similar to parts of the Roman Empire? That's the question which the remaining visions that uh, Daniel gives and the remaining uh, passages in the scripture about things like this help to clarify. So keep a few of those questions in your head as we continue on, and we'll see if we can get further clarity. Verses 24 to 28 give us more of the identity and meaning of this little horn, though. It says this, As for the ten horns, either the, the kings or the Caesars of Rome, or the sections of the Roman Empire, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings, or three sections of the empire. He shall speak words against the Most High, that's God, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, that is, chase after them, terrorize them, kill them, and shall think to change the times and the law. And they, Christians, shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the domination of the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole earth shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me. My color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. We could certainly understand after Daniel saw such a vision and, and was given a, a partial interpretation of these matters and, and all that he knew was coming, we would be alarmed as well. Now, what is this little horn, this ruler that is spoken of here? Well, it seems to be what the Bible refers to as the Antichrist. Anti, against, Christ, meaning Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. The Antichrist is a figure throughout the Bible, mentioned several times, usually in, in texts like this. Remember, we refer to these texts as apocalyptic, texts where God gives information about the future. And uh, in such passages, this, this person is referred to. Now, in this particular text, he's not used, uh, the name is not used, the Antichrist. Rather, it's this little horn. But later on in the New Testament, we're given several other passages that speak of this little horn, sometimes called a beast, sometimes called by other names, and he is the Antichrist figure. He's one who sets himself up as a world leader, firmly against God and against God's ways, even going to the extent of claiming that he is God on earth, 
and waging war against the followers of God. He's, he's a hostile figure, one that in one sense unites the world or a significant portion of the world under his rulership, but also while he does that, he is waging war against anything uh, that is part of the one true God or his followers. We're told about more about this individual in Revelation 13 and 2 Thessalonians 2. Let me just read a few verses from 2 Thessalonians 2, which refer to this person as the man of lawlessness. That's another title for him in the Bible. Paul, the apostle in the New Testament, says, Do not let anyone deceive you in any way. He's talking to Christians. For that day, the future day, when God will fully unveil his plans for the world, that day will not come until the rebellion occurs first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. That destruction we just read about in Daniel. He's using Daniel language here. He says this man will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God and desiring the worship and demanding the worship of the peoples of the world. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, so this was not new information for them? He goes on in verse 8 and says, And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. So he says, there is this person coming, he's going to do some terrible things, he's going to be very powerful, but eventually he will be overcome and destroyed. All right, I'm looking out here, how many of you are pretty warm in this room right now? Raise your hand for me. Anyone? All right, is anyone actually cold in this room? Oh, just on this side. Oh, because you got the fan right on, you get two of them, that's nice. Um, Nat, could we just maybe put those ones on a little higher or something? Uh, colder, colder, please colder, <laughs> but without, without freezing any individual. I'm just looking out, and I know um, sometimes in listening to a sermon, we can all get a little drowsy on a Sunday morning, but I'm seeing a lot of drowsiness, and I'm feeling drowsy because it is very warm up here. All right. That's, that's a good halfway break anyway. Okay, let's jump back in. So this man of lawlessness, this man of lawlessness, sometimes called the Antichrist in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist will prevail against God's people, we're told in verse 22 of Daniel 7, for a length of time. What's that length of time? We're about to get to that. But think about what this means. Regardless of what the length of time is, that this person's going to prevail against God's people, it's only for a time and then it stops. God supernaturally stops it. So what does that mean for us? It means even with the Antichrist's power, which is vast, his evil ways, his ability to manipulate human beings, as we read about in Scripture, his evil seems to have no bounds, but it does have boundaries, and within, it is all within God's control. God has certain parameters in place. He will allow it up to a certain point for a certain time for a certain purpose, and then he will put a stop to it and bring proper judgment. How long will this go on? Well, it says... This very interesting phrase, this will happen for a time, times, and half a time at the, verse, at the end of verse 25. What in the world is that supposed to mean? It's not the way we speak today, but if you look back, like we've said before, in passages like this, often uh, verses or uh, passages or words can be explained if you just go back words a little bit in the book because it's already been used. And in this case, back in chapter 4, this word was used, the same word, two times. Both times it means a year. And that's a pretty typical rendering uh, of this word in Scripture. So if it means a year, which most um, Hebrew scholars and Aramaic scholars would agree, then what this means is time, one year, times, two years, and half a time. So three and a half years is the idea. That same uh, section of time, three and a half years, is also mentioned in the book of Revelation, respond, uh, speaking about the Antichrist. So what it's saying is he has an allotted amount of time that God will allow him to wage war against God and his people, but God has superintended bookends to it. He cannot go beyond a certain point, and then God will put a stop to it. But the main thing for us to remember here is not exactly how much time or sorting out this detail or that detail. The main thing here is that the time of hardship for the followers of God is superintended or overruled by God himself. 
and he will shorten it, and it will not completely overwhelm the saints of God. That's the takeaway. That's the encouraging takeaway. Now, as a side note, this three-and-a-half-year time period uh, connects with the 70 weeks of Daniel, which will be spoken about in Daniel chapter 9. We'll get to that in due course. Uh, But just keep that in the back of your mind. This three-and-a-half-year chunk is very important, and it does, um, the text does revisit it. But the main idea so far is this. God rules over history. We saw that through all four beasts. And although his saints will suffer, as the scripture says, especially when this one of lawlessness comes, there will be an intense time of suffering. It will only be for a time, and it's within the boundaries that God himself prescribes. So God is still in control. He has a reason for why he's allowing it to happen this way, as he will make known. Now Daniel gives further clarification in the middle of the chapter, starting with the Ancient of Days. In verses 9 to 12, look at that with me if you can. Verses 9 to 12, he says this about the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is a title for God, specifically the first person of the Trinity, the Father. As I look, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Now that picture and that uh, description... If you read the book of Revelation, it will sound very familiar to you because the book of Revelation is often using imagery from Daniel 7 and the latter half of Daniel's book. But don't forget the last phrase, which is also very interesting. It says its wheels were burning fire. Why are there wheels on a throne? I have no answer to that. I don't know what these wheels are doing, but it's similar to a description Ezekiel, the prophet in the Old Testament in chapter 1 of his book, gives. We're not quite sure what this means or or how this looked, and no doubt it was very challenging for Daniel to try to describe it, whatever he's seeing here, but this is clearly a very awe-inspiring vision that he's seeing of God. Now, of course, the one true God of the Bible, as we said, is outside of space and time. As Jesus himself said in the Gospel of John, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what that means is the one true God He's not a physical being who has a physical throne, who physically goes around doing things. He is a spirit. He's not bound by the physicality that you and I are bound by. Nevertheless, when it comes to him communicating himself to people through visions and through words, like in the scriptures, he gives us images to try to approximate how we can understand him in an honest way But it's not fully how he could be described because we can only see and and sense certain things. We can only describe certain things. And so he's very gracious to us. He communicates himself to us clearly, lovingly, truthfully, honestly. And yet we should never think that when we see some, some description in the scripture that that is all that God is. So this is a description of God, it's, it's, it's describing his majesty, his purity, that is the whiteness described here. And a stream of fire issues and come out, comes out from before him, and a thousand thousands served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Now those numbers are not specific or detailed. That is, it's not precisely this amount and not a single more. These are terms that were used in Aramaic and Hebrew uh, for a vast multitude a large multitude that cannot be numbered. And the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened, and I looked, and then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and I looked, and the beast was killed. So this horn is speaking out blasphemies against the Ancient of Days. Daniel's observing this as he's observing the Ancient of Days, and then he sees God come in judgment and judge this horn or this beast, this antichrist, and the beast was killed, its body destroyed, given over to be burned with fire, and for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So all these kingdoms, all of whom uh, went against the people of God for a time or for the, the whole duration of their kingdom, all of them are judged by God. But the judgment is not exactly the same for each one of them, because not all of them did the exact same thing. If you read in history, you can read about how, for instance, after uh, Alexander the Great's empire was split into four segments, and we remember that we emphasized the last two segments, the Ptolemaic and Seleucid empires. After that happened, and Daniel will tell us more about this as we go, 
we see that those empires especially fought over the land of Israel. And some of their leaders, especially a man named Antiochus IV Epiphanes, decided that he would wage war against God's people. And he did some gruesome, terrible things to them. But he is not alone, and that kingdom is not alone. This is par for the course, we might say, when it comes to the kingdoms of this world, both ancient and modern, and their anger and their violence against God and his people. But what, is, what are we told about what happens in this judgment scene? We, we see that the books are opened. Now, what does that mean? The books are opened. Well, it at least means this. At the end of verse 10, the books were opened. It means that God keeps score. God keeps score. He keeps detailed notes. He knows what is going on. He is not surprised by what's happening, nor is he incapable of stopping it. He knows full well what is going on in this world. Though from a human perspective, it often can seem like God doesn't know. He doesn't care what's going on here. He, he certainly doesn't seem to care what's going on with Christians sometimes. Right this very moment, thousands of Christians are being hunted, terrorized, tortured, or killed around the world. Why is that? And why has that been the case for 2,000 years? Surely if God is a loving God, if he knows all, if he's fully powerful, he could stop that. And he can. But he chooses not to for a time that he is allotted. And one day, though, he will open the books and he will judge. And no one will get away scot-free. One of the greatest human desires is for justice in this world. But we have to admit that in our law courts, even if we are able to sue someone or they are brought up on certain charges, let's say the case of murder, a person has committed murder and they are convicted and given the full punishment of the law, whatever that is in a given country, the reality is full justice has never been satisfied. Why? Because there is no way to bring that dead person back, that murdered individual back. So whatever is done to the guilty party, there's no real full justice. It's just the closest approximation of justice, justice we might be able to get on this earth. But God says one day, full justice will be meted out. Every wrong will be made right and punished to the full extent of his just law. But he also tells us this fourth kingdom will be destroyed, but that the others have a measure of continuance. Now, what does that mean? Well, this suggests that the customs and the peoples from those first three kingdoms will continue to be absorbed into the fourth kingdom. And that's exactly what happened. The, the peoples and customs and the religion, the gods and goddesses of the Babylonian, then the Medo-Persian, then the Greek empires, they just kept subsuming one another until the Roman Empire came along and essentially it swallowed up all the customs and the art and the philosophy and the religion of those previous three kingdoms. In the case of, let's say, the gods and their pantheon of gods, it took all the Greek gods, which had some influence on the Persian gods, it took all of those and said, we'll use all of those, we'll just rename some of them. And so it subsumed these other kingdoms and its peoples into itself. That's what it's talking about. Now, what all this brings back home to us is what we saw at the first part of Daniel 7. It's this. All of these detailed predictions that we can see beyond a shadow of a doubt literally came true in history. All of them, each and every one, was given decades or hundreds of years before they happened. And every detail was exactly right. Not a single detail failed to come true. What does that suggest to us? Well, it suggests a supernatural author or authority behind this. Only someone who knows the end from the beginning as God, the Ancient of Days is described in the scripture, someone who knows what is going to happen, only such a being could give such an accurate prediction or vision to Daniel, and that's exactly what he did. And this should cause us, in turn, to, sh to scratch our heads, so to speak, and say, hang on a second, if that's the God of Daniel, then I need to respond to him. But we're told one last thing in verses 13 and 14 about the Son of Man who's given dominion. We're told this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man. Notice that phrasing, like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. 
Now, this is vitally important to understand, so don't, don't lose me here. I'll try not to lose you. The Son of Man is given dominion, but who is the Son of Man? Now, in the Old Testament, notice uh, how he's described here. It says in the second phrase of verse 13, and behold, he'll come with the clouds of heaven. That phrase is only used in the Old Testament of God. So whoever this being is, he's being given the same title and description as God himself, whoever this one like the Son of Man is. In Psalm 104, Isaiah 19, we see the same phrase used. It's always used of God. And many people are confused by this title, Son of Man, understandably so, um, unless you know where it's coming from. Son of Man does not mean, as many might think it might mean, uh, just a son of a man, or another way of saying a human being. That's, that's not what it means in this passage. Here's the reason why. In Daniel 8, Ezekiel 2, the phrase Son of Man sometimes is used of a prophet of God, just to refer to basically you're my human servant that's doing what I'm telling you to do as a prophet. So it's referring to them as a human being. It can be used in that way. We must admit that. But in this passage, notice he's not called son of man. He's called one like a son of man. So there's a distinction being made in some way, shape, or form. And in the New Testament, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. Not a son of man. The son of man. Clearly referencing this passage, 13 and 14 of Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man. And all the descriptors that are given here, Jesus says, apply to him. That means he is the one who will come on the clouds of heaven, meaning he is God. He is the one who has all authority and um, absolute dominion given to him by his Father. The Son of Man originates in this passage in heaven and comes to earth with divine initiative and a divine prerogative. And Jesus favorite self-designation in all the New Testament gospel accounts is this title, the Son of Man. It's a clear claim to be God, the second person of the Trinity. Now, so many individuals and cults, and especially Muslim critics of Christianity, are constantly making the claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. You've probably heard this claim over and over and over again. He never claimed to be God. He just claimed to be a teacher or a rabbi or a prophet, perhaps, or so the lie goes. But as soon as you understand this phrase, the Son of Man, you quickly realize, no, he did claim to be divine many times. In fact, 81 times Jesus uses this title in the Gospels of himself, the Son of Man. And he even uses it at his trial. And that is the final straw for the religious leaders. As soon as he refers to himself as the Son of Man and says, you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven... They rend their garments, pronounce blasphemy, and and, uh, pronounce the death sentence. Why? They knew what he was claiming. It was obvious to anyone who knew Daniel 7. Now, although Jesus clearly claims to be divine in other New Testament passages with other titles and other references, you, you really only need to look at this one passage or this one reference. 81 times Jesus uses it. Clearly, he understood he was divine. He knew it, and he proclaimed it boldly. But he's also, remember the phrasing, one like a son of man in Daniel 7. That means he is also human. So he's fully human, but he's also fully God in one being or one person. That's astounding that God would come in a human form to dwell among his people. Having all the same power and authority and dominion, that he had in eternity past in heaven. He didn't give up his Godhead, but he took on himself the form of a servant, a human being, to help serve us, his creatures. How did he serve us? By going and dying on a cross and rising from the dead to purchase our salvation from sin and death. For what goal? Why in the world would he do that? Well, so that he could share his eternal dominion in his new heavens and new earth with us. That's grace. That's love. That's generosity. We might almost say generosity to a fault, if a fault could ever be found in Jesus. So what we find are these three lessons. First of all, God rules over history. That's clear in this passage and through this vision. It's the decrees of God, not the desires of men, which rule in history. We're tempted to believe it's, it's the politicians, it's the wealthy, it's whoever... That, and it's their desires that are really in charge of this world. Or we might say more in a fatalistic way, um, 
we're not sure who's in charge, if anyone is, but we're just got to kind of dance to our DNA, survival of the fittest, bl blind chance, random universe, and fatalistic, and ho hopefully we can make it through okay. But neither of those is correct. Neither of those is correct. It is God and his decrees which control history. And the job of humankind is not to fatalistically throw up our hands and say, oh, well, I guess I'll just have to figure this out as I go and hope some karma comes back my way. Or to say, well, I want to become one of those rich and powerful people who control everything. Neither of those is the right solution. The right solution is to say, well, if God controls everything, if he's in charge, and one day he will establish his eternal kingdom, which cannot pass away, then I need to find out a way how to get on the good side of God, so to speak, so that I can be in his kingdom eternally. That's exactly why Jesus came, so that we could have a relationship with God and live with him forever. But second, the second lesson is that the kingdom of Jesus Christ will triumph over the kingdoms of this world. You remember that stone in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, vision in chapter 2? The stone came, it rolled down the hill, and toppled the statue he saw in his vision. But then what happened to that stone? It said it grew into a mountain that filled the whole earth. The kingdom that Jesus came to bring is not like the kingdoms of this world. It's different from Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome and all the other kingdoms. It is vastly different. It is eternal. It has a different starting point. It has a different leader. It has a different goal. Everything about it is different, and it will last forever. The one who is like a son of man is also God. He is the God-man, Jesus Christ, and his kingdom will be established by God in spite of of all the rebellious opposition of Nebuchadnezzar and Belteshazzar and Cyrus and Alexander the Great and the Roman Caesars. And we might add, for our own day and age in which we live, Jesus' kingdom will and is being established in spite of the rebellious opposition of President Joe Biden, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, King Charles of England, or Xi Jinping of China, or anyone else. Jesus and Jesus alone will reign. His kingdom and his alone will last. And all the machinations of all the rich and famous and powerful in this world can do nothing to stop it. Even the great Antichrist himself, who seems to be limitless in power, is limited by God and will one day be judged. The Son of Man is given dominion. That's the third lesson. And when he is given dominion, he shares that dominion with those who follow him. That doesn't mean we become God of course, but it means that he has responsibilities to give us. We have a job to do. One practical application is made by Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 11, about what this means for you and I, if you're a Christian especially today. He says in those verses, concerning the practice of Christians, how we're supposed to act, he says this, he says, you, the Christians there, you're going to the secular law courts to sue each other, as Christians, to try to get even with each other or, or get your money back or whatever the issue is. You're going to the secular law courts. But then he argues, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to be judges, rulers and reigners with Jesus Christ one day in the new heavens and the new earth, if you are to be judges and rulers and reigners with him, aren't you competent to judge some things now on meager, small-time, temporary issues that you're dealing with with your fellow Christian? It's a powerful argument. If you're to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ one day, you should be able to act in wisdom and justice now in church matters, he says. To clearly confront what needs to be confronted and to not sweep things under the rug. Outside help, like the secular law courts, although they have their place in the secular world, they should not be needed. If Christians will simply follow what God has said and respond to their brother or sister in Christ the way God said, they won't be needed. We should be models of integrity, compassion, Love, honesty, forgiveness, and wisdom in our dealings with men and women generally and with our brothers and sisters in Christ specifically. A second application is this. 2 Timothy 2.12, Paul says, If we endure, we also shall reign with him. The context has to do with our remaining faithful to the Lord in difficult times. And it's given as a warning and an encouragement. He says, If we endure, we shall reign with him. But... That implies if we do not endure or persevere in our Christian faith, we will not rule and reign with him. What is it saying? Well, among other things, what it's saying is that there are many who claim to be Christians, but over the course of their life, 
They show that their confession of Christianity is false. They don't endure. They do not persevere. They do not actively become like Christ. They do not follow his example, and they do not follow his values and his system of living, if we want to call it that. But the encouragement is for those who are true Christians and do endure and do persevere until the end, you will be saved, and not just saved, but you will also rule and reign with Christ. That is what's coming. So unlike what Richard Baxter was talking about, the saints' everlasting rest, which he's exactly right, the saints will have and inherit an everlasting rest, and that's a wonderful promise. But usually when we think of rest, what we think of is laying at the beach, eating too much food, and getting fat. That's not the type of eternal rest he's talking about. We will have a job to do in God's kingdom. It's not just laying at the beach. There will be things to do, but now, or I should say then, unlike now, we won't be hampered by sin and death and decay, the destruction of our body and the world working against us because of its sinful issues. So Christian, or those of you who claim to be Christians, are you enduring? Will you be standing firm when Christ comes? We do live in challenging times, but it's always been challenging for God's people. That's nothing new. But those who truly are his people will persevere as they look forward to God's rule and reign. God rules over history, and the way he's chosen to do that is the Father giving the Son dominion, and then after his triumph, that Son, Jesus, the one like the Son of Man, lovingly sharing his dominion with his people final thought is this. One day, the Bible says very clearly, everyone will worship God. Every knee will bow before the rightful authority of Jesus Christ. Daniel 7.14 says it. All peoples, nations, and men of every language will worship him. And Paul tells us in Philippians 2, God exalted him to the highest place. This is a song we sometimes sing here in our congregation. And gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone will worship and will bow. The Bible says that all will worship and all will bow at that great judgment day. You will bow. That's, that's not a question. But will it be willingly as you kneel before worshiping and adoring the one who gave you life and purchased your salvation with his own blood on the cross? Or will it be reluctantly as you are forced to your knees by one of his glorious angels just moments before he pronounces your eternal judgment? and sends you away from his holy and blessed presence forever. If it is to be willing adoration, willing worship, willing kneeling, then it must be adoration, worship, and kneeling now in this life. You must believe on him now. You must repent and turn to him now. Then and only then will you be part of that willing company who encircle the throne of God, giving him praise, and then and only then will you be allowed the great honor to rule and reign with Christ in his glorious new heavens and new earth. Is that your future? Or is your future far more dire? But because of what Jesus has done, even if right now what's just been described to you is not your future, to live with God in the new heavens and the new earth, to rule and reign with him and enjoy him forever and all of his wondrous gifts to us, if that's not your future, it can be today by coming to know him. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this time and this passage. There's much in here and many details. Some of them are a bit concerning and alarming, just as Daniel was alarmed. None more so than the fact that God does and will judge sin. He keeps a record. And we acknowledge, not looking at anyone else or thinking about other people, but we just acknowledge about ourselves. If you were to judge all of our sin, all the many ways that we have harmed others and harmed ourselves and disobeyed your law and displeased you, our creator, we deserve severe punishment. And knowing that you will punish the guilty, we need a way out. Thank you that Jesus, in coming to this earth as the God-man provided that way, at great personal cost, and I ask that anyone here who does not yet know him might come to know him today. And for those who would claim to know Jesus Christ, the one like the Son of Man, that you would help them to endure 
and persevere in their Christian faith. We know only those who are true followers of yours with the Holy Spirit guiding them can do so. And we pray for that wonderful, glorious outcome to rule and reign with you. For the remainder of our service, the next few moments as we sing, have our baby dedication, we pray that you will be pleased. In your name, amen.